Swiss Air 111 is en route from New York to Geneva. The passengers are settling back to enjoy the flight. Business class and economy class, they would have absolutely no idea that anything was amiss. As cabin power is cut, some passengers are mildly concerned. There's no need to worry. We'll be landing very shortly. But in the cockpit, it's a different story. I could hear a master warning tone, and I had no idea of what that meant. The pilot's attempts to control the jumbo are failing. Few on board realize they only have minutes to live. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unlock the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Golden's Bridge, New York. 4.46 p.m. Father of three, Ray Romano, is leaving on a business trip to Europe. Lynn, are you almost done, honey? Just finishing up. Is it time already? It's time. I had just made partner in his accounting firm that he worked for his entire life. Um, he was just an all-around good man. I'll see you next week. Please call? Of course. Seven forty five PM Eastern Daylight Time. New York's JFK Airport. Two hundred and fifteen passengers aboard Swiss Air Flight one eleven bound for Geneva, Switzerland. Ray Romano is in row nine, near the front of the plane. Does he have a ticket? No. No? Is he gonna sit with you? Yes. That's okay then. Captain Urs Zimmermann and First Officer Stefan Löw will fly through the night on the eight-hour journey. Fifty-two minutes into the flight, Swiss Air 111 is cruising at 33,000 feet above the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada. How about we color in the space rocket? <laughs> Welche Pläne für zu Hause? Wir können noch mal segeln und Zürich sehen. Ah, super. Da ist es eben nicht so gut da. Schauen wir da. Da ist es gar nicht so gut. Captain Zimmermann decides to land and get the plane checked. 
37 11 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have a uh, smoke in the cockpit. Uh, request immediate return uh, to a convenient place, please. I, uh, I guess, uh, Boston. 37 11 Heavy, go ahead. Air traffic control tells him Halifax Airport is much closer than Boston, just 122 kilometers away. Uh, would you prefer to go into Halifax? Affirmative for Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Uh, we prefer Halifax from our position. The airport prepares for an emergency landing. The smoke has gone, but the pilots still want the plane checked. They use oxygen masks as a precaution and begin to descend. The captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. We have a problem with the air conditioning, which needs to be rectified before we continue the flight. We will be detouring into Halifax Airport in Canada. Moncton Air Traffic Control Center, New Brunswick. I had a quick look on my radar to see where the aircraft was and estimated that it was about 20 minutes away from the airport. It's Bill Pickrell's job to guide the plane safely into Halifax. It was going to be a fairly straightforward operation because they were lined up almost perfectly for a street and approach at that point. Swiss Air 111, good evening. Can I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax? Yes, uh, vectors for 6 will be fine, uh, Swiss uh, 111 Eric. Okay, it's a back course approach for runway 06. We're 30 miles to fly to the threshold. Uh, we need more than 30 miles. Swiss Air 111, roger, turn left, heading out 0130. The plane is too high to make it into Halifax on the first pass. As a general rule, um, at that distance from the airport, uh, ideally the aircraft would have been down around 10,000 feet. In this case, they were approximately 20,000 feet or slightly above that. The pilots loop while they descend further. Swiss Air 111, when you have time, can I have the number of souls on board and the amount of fuel you have left? Roger, we must uh, dump some fuel. Maybe do that in this area during descent. My reaction was to turn to my colleague and say, oh, no, he has to dump fuel now, and then uh, immediately look to see where it would be safe to do it and at the same time keep him close to the airport. Pickrell suggests they dump over the airport or detour further and dump over the ocean. The pilots choose the ocean. It'll be about 10 miles before you're uh, off the coast. You're still within about 25 miles of the airport if you have to get to the airport very quickly. Okay, that's fine for us. Please tell me when we can start uh, to dump the fuel. The captain starts Swiss Air's procedure for dealing with smoke of unknown origin. Captain, bus switch uh, selected, confirm. He cuts unnecessary power to the cabin. Excuse me. Should we be concerned at this point? There's, there's no electricity oh. and the aircon's gone off. No, no, the captain has assured us there's no need for concern. It's just a usual procedure in an emergency landing. An emergency landing? There's no need to worry. We'll be landing very shortly. Could you strap her in, please? Der Autopilot ist weg. Der Gott, Stefan, wir haben ein Feuer. Ruf in den Notfall aus. Und wir sind der Emergency now. Copy that. 
Oh my god. The aircraft is at least six minutes from the airport. In the background, I could hear a master warning tone to the pilots, and I had no idea of what that meant. Swiss Air 111, Roger. We've lost the transponder. Transponder's gone. Come in, Swiss Air 111. All communication with the plane is lost. Swiss Air 111, come in. Air traffic controllers can now only follow its path on their radar. Swiss Air 111, come in. We noticed that the aircraft had turned away from the airport and was proceeding westbound down the coast. And that was when we realized that something had gone horribly wrong. For six minutes, Bill Pickerel watches the plane's erratic course. It was a very, very helpless feeling to just sit there and not be able to do anything about it. Suddenly they turned to the south, uh, out toward the open ocean. And the air aircraft disappeared. Oh my god, I think we've lost her. I think we've lost it. Swiss Air 111, come in. Swiss Air 111. Oh, my God. The last radar position of Swiss Air Flight 111 is nine kilometers from the Canadian shore. As word spreads, local fishermen head to sea, intent on rescuing survivors. We think now to jump in the boats in the night time and go on and, and help out as much as you can. And it was just a natural thing to do. It takes Wayne Manuel an hour to reach the site. You could see the rest of the boats that were out there at the time, but you could smell, you could smell the fuel from the jet. And as we got closer, you could see debris floating. And... Eight hundred and sixty-five kilometers away, in Goldens Bridge, New York, Lynn Romano is catching some news. 
The pilot managed to radio there was smoke in the cockpit before the plane disappeared off radar at 1,000 feet of altitude. It was I saw that there was a plane crash, which always sent chills through me. And I made the sign of the cross because I wanted to, you know, pray for these people, whether they were alive or dead, no one knew then. It was on a flight out of New York on its way to Geneva. Tom, tell us what you've been seeing and hearing from your position. The more I watched the news, uh, the more I realized that this was his flight. All evening long, um, emergency vehicles have been uh, positioned along the coastline waiting for uh, possible survivors. I called the 800 numbers and I said, look, you know, it's Swiss Air Flight 111. He's in seat 9F. I have all of the information here. Somebody's got to tell me that, that he was on this aircraft. Was it Swiss Air 111? I knew that uh, it was the same aircraft. Most of what we've seen floating were clothes and pieces of suitcases and shoes and oh, uh, I think we went past one part of the plane at one time, like probably a half a dozen windows out of the side of it. And that was the biggest, biggest thing that we've seen, I believe. Wayne hoped to find survivors. You always hope, but after you got there and you see the, what was floating, you knew that there were nothing, nothing left. There wouldn't be any survivors. The devastating news is confirmed at daybreak. All 229 people on board Swiss Air Flight 111 have perished. They basically told me, you know, there were no survivors, and I really don't remember much after that. I just, it felt like my whole soul was being sucked out of my body. The Canadian Transportation Safety Board launch an investigation. The deputy chief is Larry Vance. He has 31 years experience as a pilot and 14 as an air crash investigator. His starting point is the tape from air traffic control. We had quite a bit of information, in fact, from the very beginning because we knew that the aircraft had caught on fire, if you will and uh, that the pilots were fighting that circumstance. What we were interested in was how the fire started, how the fire spread, and how it eventually disabled the airplane. That's the key for us, was to answer those three questions. Now, by going deep into this investigation, we can reveal what caused a modern passenger airliner to plummet into the Atlantic Ocean, killing everyone on board. Before investigators can establish what caused the fire on Swiss Air 111, they must recover the wreckage. Over 20 agencies from Canada, the US and Europe are drafted in to help. Personal effects and wreckage wash ashore along 200 kilometers of rugged coastline. You will find human remains. Can't tell you how to deal with it, just deal with it and, uh, and get on with the job. Only one body is found intact. Divers and remotely operated vehicles scour the wreckage 54 meters under the sea. It was very critical for us to try and recover the black boxes because that's where you get a lot of the basic information about what was happening in the cockpit. So we were very anxious to get our hands on those. Within nine days of the crash, both black boxes are found intact. Do we see the emergency truck leads to fire air conditioning smoke? The team learn that the pilots first smelled and then saw smoke. Stefan, the rauch is weg. 
But after the smoke cleared, it returned, bringing fire with it. Swiss Air 111, check you're cleared to start the fuel dump. Hello. But investigators learn little more. The information for the last six minutes on both recorders was missing. So that was a bit of a disappointment to us. We thought we were going to have the information all the way to the impact, but in fact, we didn't. The black boxes don't provide any quick answers. But Vance is confident the plane's wreckage holds more clues. It takes months to retrieve the wreckage and personal effects. Bereaved relatives are invited to come and reclaim their loved one's possessions. The carnage was unspeakable. I mean, there were suitcases that looked like a demon could have shredded them. And yet there were certain things that were just in perfect condition that they just, you know, picked up out of the water. Lynn sees her husband's notepad with the shopping list he wrote that morning. The fact that, you know, his notepad was there, that I could read, uh, magazines were intact, but none of the passengers except one. And when I asked them, uh, you know, why? How could this be? Um, basically, they just explained it as the G-force and, uh, you know, what happens, and then I wish I never asked. Eventually, 98% of the plane is recovered. But it's in over 2 million pieces. The difficult task of finding clues is made easier as the plane crashed not on land, but in water. It presented us with a very unique opportunity because not very many times are you going to have an event where you have a full-fledged fire in progress, extinguished all at the same time, all instantly, so it preserves that fire in that moment of time. Investigators' priority is to establish where the fire began and what initiated it. Don Enns is the Transportation Safety Board's senior technical investigator. He heads the investigation's fire group. The first bits that came up that were identified as fire damage were from the uh, either the cockpit or the, the first class galley or the first class uh, compartment. So uh, we're looking at that area. Seeing that all the fire damaged wreckage is from the front of the plane, the team decides the best way to understand what happened is to reconstruct it. Like a 5,000-piece puzzle, the wreckage is painstakingly attached to a full-size wire jig. As you put more of the stuff together, the picture became more and more clear. I can remember looking at the roof of uh, Galley 1 in particular and seeing all the, the heat damage uh, from the outside in, which is actually putting the heat source above the galley. The reconstruction shows that the fire was raging not in the galley, but out of sight, above it. In the attic space, which runs the full length of the plane. It houses electronic equipment, wiring, air conditioning components, and insulation. There were no smoke detectors in the attic, and no requirement to have them. Passengers would have absolutely no idea what was going on oh, until the fire actually came through the, uh, the ceiling. And even that would only have happened in the first class galley, uh, for maybe in the first class section. At the back of the airplane business class and economy class, they would have absolutely no idea that anything was amiss. A bulkhead wall divides the attic into two compartments with a small tunnel for wiring to pass through. 
by understanding who could smell the smoke when from the black box recordings. And by looking at the fire damage on the reconstruction, the team established that the fire started in front of the bulkhead, above the cockpit ceiling, where the pilots noticed the smell almost immediately. If it had started behind that bulkhead wall, it would have done a lot more damage, more rearward into the fuselage, and the people in the back of the airplane would have smelt smoke and odor before the people in the cockpit did. Now they know where the fire started. They need to work out how it started. One of the things that we looked for, of course, was whether or not there was any criminal activity involved. Close inspection of some of the wreckage suggests there was. Very early on in the investigation, we started finding in what looked like buckshot from a shotgun shell. The little ball bearing things, they were everywhere. In the seats and the seat backs and so on, we're thinking, well, somebody's in the airplane shooting it up, you know, like, what's going on here? They question whether the fire was part of a terrorist plot where someone boarded the plane with a shotgun. Until they learn what was in the plane's cargo hold. It turns out that they were the little tips for ballpoint pens. Those little tiny roller things that they put in the end of a ballpoint pen. There were tens of thousands of those things. The plane hit the sea with such force, it shot the ball bearings through the cargo hold into the cabin and cockpit. With criminality ruled out, Vance and his team must consider other possible causes of Swiss Air 111's fire. We know where the fire started. We knew it was up above the ceiling in the cockpit area. And then you start looking for potential ignition sources up there. And, and right away, the obvious one that comes to mind is wiring. The plane housed 250 kilometers of wiring. 3,000 pieces have been collected from the crash site. Air crash investigator Jim Foote knows his team's task is enormous. First, they must try to identify where each wire came from. The B wires were from uh, basically in the cockpit back to the first door. So those wires we were definitely interested in. Any wire that began with the letter B, we wanted. Now we're going to be examining every inch of this wiring. Jim's team search for damaged or missing insulation to see if they can find the wire that ignited the fire. Any wire, if you get the wire rubbing against a, a metal piece, then you can wear through that insulation. And if that wire is powered, then you could have an arcing event as it touches that structure. An arcing event is an electrical discharge which leaps from an exposed live wire. Like a tiny bolt of lightning, it creates a split second flash of light and intense heat. This arc melts the wire's copper threads, leaving a telltale copper ball. It's these copper balls the team search for. They find 20 wire segments that had arced. Most of them ran through the ceiling of the cockpit. Any of them could have sparked the fire. Eight of the wire segments powered the state-of-the-art personal in-flight entertainment system, which was fitted to the first and business class cabins in the year before the disaster. But despite extensive testing, investigators can't pinpoint which arcing event ignited the inferno. Quite disappointed with, with all the effort that we had put in, all the material that we had recovered, that we hadn't isolated ourselves down to uh, the lead event, the lead event arc. Analysis of the wiring comes to an end. Jim Foote is resigned to not finding the initiating arc. But as he packs up, 
he takes one last look at one of the arced wires from the in-flight entertainment system. He wasn't treating them quite as carefully as he had in the past, so he was opening up the ends that were all crumpled up. I started to unravel these wires. Uh, lo and behold, I found a second arc mark on the same phase as one of the other ones that we already noted. Larry. Have a look. I knew these wires well enough, and Jim knew them well enough, that when I looked through that microscope and I saw that tiny little arc, I thought, wow, that's it. We found it. Jim found it. To confirm that this is the arc that sparked the fire, they place it into a mock-up of the cockpit ceiling's wiring system. There's a lot of wires that come through the ceiling at that area, and they're attached to a metal bracket. It, what we think happened is that this wire chafed on this bracket. Planes are subjected to constant vibration as they travel at over 900 kilometers an hour. Investigators believe vibration caused the chafing. The wire's insulation became damaged, allowing the wire to arc on the metal bracket. We finally come to a conclusion in our own minds, almost instantly, to say that had to be it, because we knew from the positioning of those wires that where he had found that little arc was exactly where the fire had started. The team were concerned the in-flight entertainment system had not been properly installed. As a precaution, Swiss Air removed this non-essential system from its entire fleet. We can begin to speed up this process. Investigators had found the source of the fire on Swiss Air 111, but there were more questions they wanted to answer. They knew the pilots couldn't prevent the fire. They needed to know whether they could have prevented the crash. As investigators, you have to say what circumstances were these pilots in that caused them to do what they did that led to the eventual uh, loss of the aircraft. Vance and his team scrutinized the decisions they made in the minutes before impact. The black box recordings tell them that the cockpit filled with smoke and fire just moments after the pilots turned off excess power to the passenger cabins. One of the things that they end up turning off is they turn off the recirculating fans which are in the back, and that changed the whole airflow for the fire. These fans had drawn the blaze through the bulkhead, away from the cockpit area. Once switched off, the blaze changed direction. It just went like that. It changed just, just right off the bat. The fire raged above the cockpit, burning through the ceiling and disabling critical aircraft systems. It took out almost all of the pilot's instruments that they used to control the airplane, to fly the airplane, to keep it upright, to know which way's up and which way's down. And these instruments all started to fail, all in and around the same time. The stricken plane was no longer flyable. But the pilots are not blamed for turning off the power to the passenger cabins. They were following Swiss Air's procedure for managing smoke of unknown origin. Ultimately, there was one critical decision the pilots made in the minutes before the crash, which attracted widespread criticism. There are still questions about whether the pilots took too long to try an emergency landing. Investigators say they turned towards Halifax, but then looped again over the sea to dump fuel. The pilot's choice to dump fuel added minutes to the flight. It was a procedure they could have ignored. Investigators want to know whether this detour cost the lives of the 229 souls on board. So what was our initial uh, altitude? It was... Uh... Uh, 33,000 feet. They calculate that for a direct approach to Halifax, the pilots should have started their descent at the moment they declared pan, pan, pan. 
But at this time, they didn't know that Halifax Airport was an option. Furthermore, a fully functioning plane would have needed 13 minutes to make the descent. Theirs was only flyable for 10. By the time they decided they were going to dump fuel, they weren't going to make it to Halifax anyway. They were going to crash somewhere. Their decision on whether or not to dump fuel did not make one iota as worth a difference as to whether or not they were going to live or die. Captain Urs Zimmermann and First Officer Stefan Löw are cleared of any responsibility for the crash of Swiss Air 111. The investigation team successfully reconstructed the front of the plane, established where the fire began, and found the arc that sparked it. But they know a single spark did not bring the airplane down. To prevent future fires, the team needed to find out what had been burning. The threat to the airplane, in fact, was what was fueling the fire. If you have flammable material, in such abundance that is capable of burning the airplane up. That's the real threat to the airplane. All the materials in American planes have to pass the US Federal Aviation Authority's flammability test before they can be used. But something in Swiss Air 111's attic was clearly very flammable. I can think of nothing in the areas that exist that would promote burning. Their attention is drawn to the shiny metallized material that covered the fiberglass insulation, MPET, more commonly known as metallized mylar. We recovered some of that insulation blanket cover material, the metallized mylar floating on the ocean, there were little pieces of it, and what do you suppose, but it showed uh, burn marks. Uh, it showed that it had been on fire. Metallized mylar was installed in 699 US registered planes. If it had fueled the fire, all of them were also at risk. This is the first thing I've seen. We had enough of it that we were recovering that wasn't burned that we took a wee bit of it and uh, set it on the hangar floor and touched a match to it. Oh my God. Look at that. That's incredible. And what do you know? It burned like crazy. Uh, very flammable. And we thought, man, this airplane is full of that stuff. Vance is confident that metallized mylar fueled the fire on Swiss Air 111. Yes. Uh, we think we've come across what might be the problem. Um, he immediately informs uh, the US Federal Aviation Authority. It's a uh, cut fire. They had flame tested metallized mylar more than 10 years earlier and passed it for use. One of the things that we did was to go back and look at the history of this metallized mylar to see if there had been previous opportunities to identify that as a hazardous material. And in fact, we found several events during which metallized mylar was on fire in airplanes. As a result of these previous fires, the plane's manufacturer, McDonnell Douglas, suggested metallized mylar should be stripped from all their aircraft. Four years before the Swiss air crash, the US Federal Aviation Authority had retested metallized mylar and found it was flammable. But they didn't ban it. The fact is that none of them had caused the loss of life. Had one of these previous accidents resulted in a number of fatalities, if you had a body count, then they may well have reacted differently. The FAA now had a body count of 229. Again, they tested the metallized mylar, subjecting it to much more realistic in-flight fire conditions. It failed. The FAA gave US Airlines four years to strip it from their planes. We know that we got results because we had blood on the water. There were a number of people did, and then people paid attention to it. And then we were able to move forward with our safety message and have it accepted. 
the investigation into Swiss Air 111 was the longest the Canadian Transportation Safety Board had ever undertaken. It took four and a half years to complete. Using the detailed information that investigators unearthed, we can now reveal precisely what took place on Swiss Air 111 and what the pilots faced in the minutes before impact. Twenty-one minutes to disaster. A wire in the attic arcs, igniting metalized mylar. The pilots smell something strange, but think it's an air conditioning problem. Eighteen minutes to disaster. Seeing smoke, they decide to land and head towards Halifax. Sixteen minutes to disaster. Air conditioning fans suck the attic fire towards the back of the plane. This clears smoke from the cockpit. Eleven minutes to disaster. While looping to lose height, the pilots choose to detour further and dump fuel over the ocean. They don't know what's happening in the attic. Eight minutes to disaster. The captain cuts power to the cabin. This shuts down the air conditioning fans, allowing the inferno to rage directly above the cockpit. Seven minutes to disaster. The blaze destroys the autopilot system, forcing the pilots to fly manually. Only now do they realize the enormity of the problem. Investigators suspect Captain Zimmerman fights the fire, leaving First Officer Love to fly the stricken plane. Six minutes to disaster. The fire disables the flight displays, communications with air traffic control, and the black boxes. In the searing heat, First Officer Love struggles to keep control. But the plane is no longer flyable. All 229 passengers and crew are dead. To ensure against further loss of life, Canada's Transportation Safety Board made recommendations. Many have been adopted globally by the aviation industry. They suggested that procedures for dealing with smoke of unknown origin be radically rethought. Our recommendation was that if you have smoke or odor in an airplane, that you have to assume that it is a fire that's out of control until you prove otherwise. And that, I think, has sunk its way into the aviation community a lot better than, than it did before Swiss Air 111. Investigators' biggest success was the banning of flammable metallized mylar. We know as a result of the Swiss Air 111 investigation that materials that might otherwise have been put in airplanes are no longer being put in airplanes, so a lot of good work has been done and a lot of good safety action has been taken. While metallized mylar is no longer used in Western countries, airlines in some developing countries have not been persuaded to remove it from their planes. Lives are still at risk. The next steps to make air travel safer may only be taken after another tragic incident. There has to be another event which refocuses people's attention and that you have to say, we told you so, and you didn't fix it, now you better fix it because it's going to happen again. You cannot make people make change unless they feel a liability.
Uh, would you prefer?